Hello. On this next episode, we're going to be talking about the extraordinary journey that Beaver has had with military history. I'm actually not a historian, but I've had to learn on my feet here at Beaver. And it's been fascinating because there have been four castles on the site here. And I wanted to find out exactly what, if, what were the battles around Beaver and why had these castles been knocked down. So I looked to finding the best around me to guide me. And I found a military historian called Patrick Mercer. He's rather special and he's coming on board and he's going to guide me through all the battles that have surrounded this area and also the weaponry that cover the walls of Beaver and why we've got it. So I do hope you enjoy this conversation with Patrick Mercer. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Number one, what is your official title? <laughs> I'm a retired colonel uh, from one of the local regiments. I was an infantry officer for 25 years. I am a local man, live in Newark. I've done a number of different things. I was a BBC journalist, I was a member of parliament, and now I'm a full-time historian. Wonderful. That sounds very exciting. <laughs> it has its moments. And what does that mean you do as a full-time historian? Try not to confuse people too much about the past, really. Um, I, I think it's terribly important to make the past accessible and enjoyable for people to understand and to learn lessons. So tell me... What is the history here, the military history here at Beaver? Is it relevant? Is it of yeah. interest? Of course, it's hugely relevant. Beaver occupies not, not the castle itself, which is a relative, as I don't need to tell you, is a relatively modern building. But it, it occupies a strategic position right in the East Midlands. So dominating really the approaches to the coast, the crossings of the Trent, and, and the main roads up through the Beaver Valley, up through, through along the, 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 the Trent Valley, up towards the north and into South Yorkshire. Therefore, very important sites here during the Wars of the Roses, very important sites here during the English Civil Wars, or the British Civil Wars more correctly. And then, of course, um, most interesting, in relatively modern times, we had Scottish rebels knocking on the door of Beaver in 1745, 1746, during the Jacobite Rebellion. And then, I mean, that is, that is simply the, the, what, what happens here in the castle. But the family, of course, redolent of military history and, and a, a vast contribution to the safety and the prosperity of the, and, and the gallant co courage and conduct of the whole country. So, yes, almost everything you touch inside the castle is dripping with military history. But then I would say that, wouldn't I? <laughs> Our guard room is a great, magnificent sort of show of grandeur and, I suppose, yes, it's a show-off of how many were in our garrison. Would that be correct? Absolutely. This is the, particularly in the 18th century and then later the 19th century, this is the administrative headquarters for the local forces that are here. So, so without getting too technical about it, regiments of militia, so, so the counties of Rutland and Leicestershire, their militia regiments, their part-time regiments, are reflected here as being a headquarters, a mustering point for raising these regiments in time of war. And then when, when the threat diminishes, their weapons have got to be kept somewhere. And you can't, clearly, you can't send every man home with his weapon because the thing will, will be neglected or abused or whatever. So when the militia is raised, when they, so they, the men are called to arms, this will be an issuing point for the weapons, swords, muskets, bayonets, particularly the leather equipment, which I may, if I may, I'll talk about in a moment. Yes. And then when the threat diminishes, so when the, we've beaten the French yet again, or whoever the enemy is at the time, the militia will come back here, will stand down, and their weapons will be oiled, cleaned, and laid up here inside the castle. But remarkably, I, the muskets, the swords, the pistols are wonderful things, of course, and they're relatively scarce, but... The leather equipment, which has been which has survived from the 1780s in some cases, so the cross belts, cartridge pouches, certain waist belts and frogs, the thing from which a sword or a bayonet hangs, the fact that you've still got leather equipment here in such good order is remarkable, quite remarkable. Oh, 
Oh, I'm pleased to hear that, Patrick. Mm. And what, what, what also fascinates me is the sort of trophies of war that yes. we have. Yeah, Can you absolutely. just talk to us of course, of course. about those? Now, getting on to my, one of my favourite subjects is the Marquis of Granby. The Marquis of Granby, whose who's popularity really comes at the end of the Seven Years' War, during at the end of the Seven Years' War, 1756 to 1763. Never becomes a duke because his, he predeceases his father. Nonetheless, is one of the most significant military heroes of the 18th century. So, so he's an officer of the, amongst other things, the Royal Horse Guards, and he fights in Germany, uh, low countries, winning a series of victories. The, the thing I like so much about him is that all over the country, you can find pubs called the Marquis of Granby. Why? Well, there, there are a number of, of, of misinterpretations of this. But What's the real reason? I think it's because he's such a good leader that he, he looks after his soldiers in particular. Soldier's widow or soldier's wife or family is on hard times. A few guineas will turn up, all the way sent by the personal hand of the Marquis to look after them. A soldier who's injured in battle will get a pension from the Marquis. And the reason that you find pubs all over the place is, well, a pub is a jolly good business to have at any time, but obviously in the 18th century particularly. But why wouldn't you name it after a man you admire? The Marquis of Granby. So what are your favourite pieces of weaponry around the castle, Patrick? There's one that stands out for me above and beyond everything else. The Marquis of Granby would have had decorative swords to wear. So on parade, he would, he, he would have had a richly, um, richly decorated sabre of one sort or another. But here inside the castle is his fighting sword. Um, you'd have to look carefully to realise that it's a cavalryman's weapon, heavy bladed, straight bladed, unused, not like a prop, an old the sabre that we understand. He's carried that in action. He's hewn the nation's enemies with that sword. This, he was not a man to hang back. He got right at the front of his troops and he was noted as being a very competent swordsman. Think what it means to ride your horse up close to your opponent, look him in the eyes and sabre him or indeed to be sabred by him. That's an act of courage which, which we shouldn't forget. And here, there's the sword that he led his troops with at Warburg. It's quintessentially beaver, and it's quintessentially Marquis of Granby. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. And that was actually the first thing when David, when I first met David, he gave me his card, funnily enough, and it said, Marquis of Granby, and I thought he most probably owned a pub. <laughs> I've never heard of a Marquis before. And, um, Why not? No, exactly. Why not? Why not? I, then he told me the history, but hearing it from your words today, you painted this extraordinary picture of this man whose portrait sits in our state dining room and looks at us every time we have a meal. And now you've sort of put the character behind the person. Good. It's magic. Thank you. Delighted. It's always interesting because it, I've had to really learn it, Patrick, and I try every day to learn a little bit more about how to preserve it. But why is it important to keep this sort of collection together? I think, Your Grace, it's, it's terribly important. And why is it important? Well, because that's a lesson. That's a lesson. Are people ever going to descend into the sort of brutality that the Marquis of Granby saw in 1760? Yes, they are. We've got war in Europe again at this very moment. People thought we'd grown out of that. No, we haven't. Let's learn the lessons from the 18th century, the 19th century, and from the families and the great heroes that we've been talking about. Let's keep those weapons as a reminder. That hopefully it never happens again on our island. Let's hope on our soil that we are never affected by these sorts of things again. But I wouldn't bet on it. Well, thank you so much. It's been a great honour to have you with us today. And I can't wait to hear more about the fascinating history that we have in our walls. The honour is mine, Your Grace. Thank you. If you've enjoyed the video and want to see more, make sure you subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next episode.